Hello, Buddhist Geeks. This is Vince Horn, and I'm joined today by uh, Douglas Rushkoff, who I'm finding out very quickly knows a lot more about Buddhism than I thought. Good to have you here. More than I thought. <laughs> I tried everything is Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just good to have you on the show. It's, it's really a delight to have you here, and I know a lot of the Buddhist Geeks audiences are really stoked that we're going to be chatting, so uh, thank you. Cool. I'm just definitely excel at the geek side of Buddhist geek, but that's okay. That's awesome. That's a Jubu geek. <laughs> we we love it. We love it. Um, cool. So just a short, just a brief intro for people who aren't familiar with your work yet. Um, they will be at the end of this show. Um, Douglas is a media theorist, uh, among other things, an author. Most recent book is Present Shock: When Everything Happens Now. And um, we wanted to speak with you today about Present Shock and some of the kind of really to me, the more interesting um, aspects that relate to contemplative practice and Buddhist practice in particular, um, and just see if we can kind of mash those things up and see where, where things go. Um, so on a basic level, just to start off, uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit about present shock. Like, what does it mean to be uh, in, present, in a state of present shock? Uh, wh what does that feel like, and, and why is that important? Well, um, present shock is the human response to living in a world where everything happens now, you know, everything happens in, in the moment. So it's this, um, uh, it's kind of a, a, an always on real time existence that doesn't have a beginning or an end, it doesn't have a past or a future, it doesn't have origins or goals, it's just kind of the now. And on the one hand, I mean, that could be healthy, right? If you were really in the now, if you were truly in the present, um, you know, that might be glorious, but for most people it doesn't take the form of a genuine presentism. It takes the form of what I'm calling present shock, which is a, a state of being kind of constantly distracted or panicked or interrupted. You know, it's the, it's the, the always on state of uh, uh, having your, your cell phone strapped to your body and having it vibrate or ping you every time somebody updates you or emails you or tweets about you and kind of doing to your nervous system what what only you know 911 operators or air traffic controllers used to experience this mm. you know state of perpetual you know emergency readiness and constantly you know uh, uh, responding to these impulses that aren't really timed to any natural cycle. They're not, um, they're not really of human origin. You know, they're of <laughs> machine origin. And um, it, it makes it really hard for a person to have um, any sense of, of center. You know, uh, you know while, while, you know, traditionally, you know, we might look at it as, uh, oh, the person, you know, you have no Know, you know goals and you're not working towards anything you can't make progress you know even those are sort of industrial age sort of artificial goals I'm I'm ultimately more concerned with um, uh, the the more spiritual imbalance that occurs and I hate even to use the word spiritual because then it sort of isolates it off in the spiritual ghetto but mm. the the dehumanizing effect of this right I feel like we've optimized our human organisms and our our human culture to digital time you know to this highly sequenced staccato interruptive step-by-step -step quality of time sort of like a very bad mp3 recording and trying to dance to that um, rather than uh, optimizing our technologies to human time and as a result we are um, becoming unhinged from the cycles, uh, both social and biological and astronomical, that have you know guided human physiology and consciousness for hundreds of thousands of years. Mm, okay, cool. I want I want to go into several of those points you just made and unpack it a little more because this is really really interesting. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to see if you'd be up for talking a little bit about your background with. Uh, again, not to, every word we use, as you said, sort of uh, segmented out as if it's the separate area, when in mm -hmm. fact it's not. But I'm uh, curious what your background is with, with sort of contemplative practice or psychedelic exploration. I know that's something you've talked mm -hmm. a bit about. Um, just kind of how you got into the, initiated into the kind of uh, mysteries of consciousness, I guess. 
Um, honestly, I was initiated um, through theater, right? Which is an underestimated practice uh, because it's gotten so you know crass commercialized. It's about you know watching some soap opera actor show up on a stage, but. Um, I was, you know, very interested in theater from the time I was five or six years old, and um, you know the whole idea that some people would be on a stage pretending while other people are sitting quietly. Not um, so watching theater or performing theater were both to me um, meditative, contemplative acts that required, you know, focus and concentration, and um, it's just it's a really deep ritual, you know, and I. I began investigating it pretty deeply when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old, reading about theater and truth and, you know, the the Apollonian rituals of the court versus the Dionysian ones of the of the theater and what that all meant for a society. So um, theater and its connection to ecstatic ritual were mm. always um, a part of my life. You know, and then, uh, you know, reading Artaud, and folks like that who who talked really explicitly and made kind of really direct connections between ecstatic ritual and uh, uh, and theater ritual, um, you know, those were significant to me as well as the intellectual path of theater, the sort of the Brechtian notion that we're going to use this as an intellectual journey, not to get people to love some hero and watch that hero have a realization, but rather as a way of um, distancing ourselves from the hero's plight, you know, through all of these Brechtian alienation mechanisms and being able to contemplate it and wow. then uh, uh, behave more appropriately once we leave the theater or foment revolution if that's what's necessary. So theater was really it. Um, then uh, in college, I guess my, my theater artsy friends, um, you know, exposed me to psychedelics, which was a a big second step in it because a psychedelic trip in a way is like an Aristotelian uh, 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 tragedy you know <laughs> it's like it's like going through the poetics mm. or something um, and you know and for me it was never like you know to go to the ACDC parking lot and get trashed it was more about you know here we're going to go on this journey you know and right away in the, uh, uh, the Princeton psychology library we found we found this um, Tim Leary and Richard Alpert's book Psychedelic Experience, which is basically it's a psychedelic manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Tibetan Book of the Living and Dying, depending on your perspective. So what they did was they took the bardos, I mean they took the actual text and they just kind of translated it but with a slightly more um, psychedelic quality to it and that's when I was realizing that oh there really is a, a connection between these, you know, sacred plants and experiences and, uh, you know, these kind of spiritual practices. I uh, never really got into uh, Buddhism as a thing, like, you know, going to one of those places and sitting with people in robes and stuff. But I read a lot, you know, I read a lot of Alan Watts and listened to a lot of Alan Watts tapes. And... Um, uh, you know, I read the Dhammapada and things like that, some of these the shorter um, Buddhist books. Mm -hmm. And um, I met uh, Bob Thurman when I was in my 20s. He was actually, I met him through the same, he and I went to this this guy, it turned out it was this totally fake guru, but Bob Thurman believed this guy was real, so then I believed he was this guy who's kind of made light and it was a whole thing. Wow. But it was just one of those guys who, you know, comes from India and gets flash paper and blowjobs and things, you know, there's a, a pretty, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of common, Americans are gullible, um, but I met him, and then, and he had just translated this uh, book about Virmala Kirti, yeah. who was this sort of really mean Buddhist teacher, or like a friend of Buddha, but he would, like, Buddha would send his, his troubled students over there, and the guy would just be like, kill yourself, you know, I mean, it really mean, um, so I read that, and, and, uh, and that's when I kind of realized I didn't want to have a path. And then I read Krishnamurti, and I don't know if he counts as Buddhist or not, but um, I read him, and I was reading this book of his, and it was right at the point where he said, um, you know, he's really sick of people saying that all paths are fine, because if all paths are fine, it means that no paths are fine. So I got on this whole thing of like, a path of no path? Oh, you mean I don't have to do any of this? Um, and I just stopped altogether doing anything. And I got um, anti-spiritual because mm. it seemed to me that spirituality... Um, 
discrete spirituality was creating a duality in my life. Oh. I was like, okay, now I'm going to work. I'm going to go work for some advertising agency coming up with a new campaign for Oreos, but then I'm going to go all weekend and, and do this thing. And I decided right around then, that, yeah, God, I really want my life to be the practice, you know, yes. period. Um, and I don't want there to be me and a guru or me and the student. I want it to just to be. Um, and right around then, I uh, got introduced to Tai Chi. I was in theater graduate school. And I just got really into Tai Chi as a way of, uh, it's a moving meditation. So it's good for a kind of hyper person because you're, you distract the mind with this form. Yes. But then you go, you know. But the beauty of it for me is it. There was no. Um, there's no position, right? There's no thing. There's no. Um, it's like unlike certain kind of hatha yoga forms, which, at least to me, invite me to think of, oh, this is the position I'm trying to get to. Mm. Tai Chi, you're always in motion. And, you know, we have these names for the different sort of moves in Tai Chi, but then you realize that the moves don't really, aren't really moves either because the stuff you do to get from this move to that move is a move also. So there's no way to say now you're in this move, now you're in that move. It's just one big flow. So for me, that sort of Tao quality of constant change um, was good because it broke down, I mean, a little rationalist Jewish left, brain thinker like me, <laughs> it forced me into, when am I doing Tai Chi and when am I not? Even that, I can't, I can't really say. When did the practice start? You know, and then it shouldn't really start. It should be, then I should always be doing it. You know? And that's what got me finally to you know, things like the book Present Shock, which is the spirituality of being in an always-on state. You know, always-on should not mean always online. Always yeah. on should be you're always alive. When you're awake, when you're dreaming, when you're having sex, when you're not, when you're working, when you're always there. You're always present. It's always there. You know, and the Christians tried to get to it by saying, oh, well, God is watching you all the time. But that's like always, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> always watched, always. Um, God is watching you as if that's what's going to keep you alert to the fact that everything matters. But, you know, if you can do it or I, th I feel like if I can do it by, uh, it's sort of my way of uh, embracing the moment. My way of embracing it is by letting it pass and letting it move, feeling, feeling that, that constant, uh, the constant change, you know, and even change in the stillness and stillness in the change. It's just all okay. Then I don't have to um, say, okay, now I'm going to sit. And they, you know, for me, when the practices come, oddly enough, I practice at the bad times, right? If I'm having, if, if my wife says something to me that really I feel is inappropriate or pisses me off or something, that's when I got to practice. Yes. You know, because I'm, now I'm no longer letting reality pass by without judgment and without like now I've just labeled that was shitty you know so <laughs> I've just done that how do I let that pass you know mm. so that's sort of um, so yeah and now I do you know there wasn't a great uh, uh, Tai Chi class for me here so I ended up um, uh, I moved you know I'm living outside New York now and I uh, take yoga I'm doing yoga twice a week, but it's this kind of yoga called vinyasa. Yeah. And the idea of it, I think, you know, and I'm still a beginner. I'm in total beginner mode. It's been it's two years now, but I'm actually maintaining beginner mode so that it's sort of an exercise for me. I want to never think of myself as an expert in this thing because I'm getting like labeled as an expert in a lot of things because I'm mm. now 52. And I'm like, oh, cyber guru guy or viral media expert or expert. And I like having this place where I, I preserve, you know, effort, I effortfully preserve the beginner. Everything is new. It's always new. Each time I do Warrior One, it's like it's for the first time. And I want to maintain that sense of naivete and freshness to it. But, yeah, so I do this vinyasa yoga, which is more about flow than positions. You're always, you're not like, it's not like really exercise flow, but it's like it's in motion, which I find... Um, I don't know. It's more consonant with 
what I'm trying to work on, which is staying with things yes. rather than capturing, you know, capturing things. Okay, that's that's awesome. Wow, there's a lot of cool stuff in there too. Um, so, okay, good. So maybe we can come back around to some of the things you brought up there because I think they're relevant to the to conversation about present mm -hmm. shock. Um, one thing you said, uh, which you sort of preemptively answered one of my questions a little bit, um, that was one of the most interesting parts for me reading the book was your description of present shock as being what you just described constantly but sort of bombarded by this sort of uh, uh, this sort of always on digital mode which is sort of in contrast to how we're actually seem to be programmed and seem to be like wired um, to use some mechanical analogies yeah um, which is kind of odd um, but I'm curious uh, you know when you talked about um, well, I'll just read a little excerpt, actually, from President Jack, and we can just jump into it. Uh, you wrote, for while many of us were correct about the way all this presentism would affect investments in finance, even technology and media, we were utterly wrong about how living in the now would end up impacting us as people. Our focus on the present may have liberated us, liberated us from the 20th century's dangerously compelling ideological narratives, but it has not actually brought us into greater awareness of what is going on around us. We are not approaching some Zen state of an infinite moment, completely at one with our surroundings, connected to others, and aware of ourselves on an, on a, any fundamental level. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. It, do you, I, I, my first thought was, do you think that is possible? And and then, do you think it's actually possible to 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 turn this sort of present shock into a kind of more of a present awakeness or a present awareness? And and what and what is the you know what is the path in your mind on on how to get there from here? Because clearly we're not there now, and that's kind of the big point you make in the book. Yeah, um, you know it's not just the fault of digital technology. You know whatever um, time keeping or time tracking measurement technology we have um, creates an environment in which it creates an alternative environment to the one that humans actually live in. Right? So, you know, you have, you know, prehistoric people, you know, living by the sun and the moon and all this, just sort of in this constant change, unaware of of time the way we think of it. They get the invention of text, of 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 writing, of the alphabet. And once they can write things down, then all of a sudden you have a past and a future. Once you can write things down, now you have history because history is being recorded. What happened today? What happened yesterday? This, that's how you get the story of the Jewish people. You know, this was us. This is what happened. You're writing it down. Mm. Once you can write stuff down, you're also accountable to the future. Oh, you work on my field now, and next year when the harvest comes, I will give you 30, you know, bushels of grain. So writing allowed us to time travel originally. It gave us um, history and it gave us contracts. We got the covenant with the Torah, with God. You know, we got um, the messianic age, right? Because now we have a future. So if you people do this now, I will send you a Messiah. And we're going to put that down, right? So Torah is a covenant, it's a contract with God. So we ended up then in a society that was no longer in this, but now was thinking in terms of Back then, God promised us something, and over there in the future, we're going to get it, right? So now we're in this timescape. Now we're in a story, and we're in this part of the story, but it came from there, and it's going there. And it's okay if we kill those people over there on that hill, because they're not the ones who have promised the thing back there. God told us that they were bad, and they're not the ones who are going with us down there, right? So now we've got us and them, all this other stuff going on. Um, although there was us and them before, it, it became a different it, uh, us and them over time. It became about legacy and promises and and uh, uh, future fulfillment of today's uh, of today's uh, tragedies or goals. When we got the the clock clock, then we got the mechanical clock in the industrial age, and then that came along with a whole other notion of time. Now instead of uh, uh, working and making something and selling it to another person. Now we work 
for time. Now I work this many hours. Now I punch the clock. You know, the villagers all looked at the clock in the town square to know how long are we working. But that separated, this led to Marxism. It separated us from the value we created and instead turned us into people who are working over time. And we ended up in this, you know, ridiculous time is money, um, interest bearing currency, growth based colonialist expansionist. Uh, uh, society, industrial society. When digital technology came around, you know, this was in the 1980s, I was a slacker, right, and, and a conscious <laughs> slacker. I was one of the people who didn't want to become a yuppie scum, right, and, and whatever, and work for some retirement plan and get ridiculous clothes, and, you know, and there are a lot of us, and you, you look at, you know, Rick Linkletter's movie Slacker, and you can see what, it wasn't about being lazy, it was about having time to, you know, read Hegel, and argue about it. It was about doing stuff that just didn't matter, right? Because who cares? Um, so slack was really the ability, you know, you work at some temp job as much as you had to in order to have slack to actually seize life and be with your friends in non-commodified spaces, just being, not working, not spending, because who cares? I can sit and talk with my friends in a record store and have a genuinely profound social, that's it. Um, so digital technology came around and I thought, well, this is great. Now we can work in our own time from home in our underwear, right? We're not going to have to go to some job and punch the clock. I can make stuff. I can write at home. I can make software at home and sell it or shareware it or, or do whatever. But the, the program nature of digital time was going to let us do things on our own clock. And instead of doing that, we ended up taking digital technology and the internet and using it to service the NASDAQ stock exchange. Right? The, uh -huh. These technologies became, rather than the alternative to industrial time and industrial business, it became the salvation of industrial business. So the stock market, the expansionist economy, which had run out of room, right? We had, we had gone to California. That's as far west as you can go without starting over again, right? We had expanded around the globe. Little brown people were fighting back. There was nowhere left to go, nothing more to dig out. People had more than enough stuff. They have storage units for their stuff. We're finally at the place where we can go, oh my gosh, we can stop all that. But instead, we use digital technology to find new surface area. Right? And that new surface area, the new uh, uh, room, the new commodity became human time. Right? So Wired Magazine announced that we're living in an attention economy. And the attention economy is measured in terms of eyeball hours. So it turns out, you know, yeah, people are working eight hours a day, but that means they have another 16 hours a day to produce and consume. So we're going to get them online. We're going to get them looking at the screens, create sticky websites, create apps, and get people involved all the time. If you are not online consuming or producing 24-7, that means there's still real estate that can be taken up. So digital technologies which could have let us transcend the time is money reality and return to, uh, uh, to real time, to real human time, to socializing, you know, which could have, instead of just leading to a new dot-com bubble and VC and startups and this insanity, could have freed us into much more of an Etsy, Burning Man-like, real-time, peer-to-peer economy where we're just trading with people for the stuff we need. You know, we, we ended up just investing more in this, in this crap and giving ourselves less time. So we have actually less time now, even though we have better technologies than we did before. We have to work more now, even though we have more efficient technologies than we did before. And why is that? And it's because we're trapped in a market scheme of which we're not conscious, right? And rather than become conscious of that and reclaim our time, we, uh, uh, we live by it. And the way we get to practice is by getting rich enough so that you can go to Esalen or Omega or somewhere and practice your Buddhism or rich enough so you can build a little, you know, Zen room in your house and have little monks visit you, uh, you know, and pay them a couple thousand bucks. And, of course, they're just laughing behind your back because you're a sold-out capitalist tool. You know, and the only way to do it is, is, is for real, right? No division. There's no holy and not holy. But uh, we're, just, we're just not there. Okay, interesting. I want to go into a couple of things you're saying here, which I, which I, by the way, really appreciate. It's I, political I, for me, I guess, is what I'm saying. It's, no, absolutely, I get you know. that, and and I think that 
it makes sense given how you're describing spirituality, which is something that's not this sort of dualistic uh, thing that exists over here, you know, that doesn't have any implication to these other structures and systems which are in place. And I, I really appreciate that. There's something you said when you were talking to Leo Laporte about um, this very thing. You said, you know, here are all these young startup entrepreneurs and people and they're going and creating things and creating these sticky apps and websites and then and the going, first thing they do is go to Goldman Sachs yes. you know, and get it get a friggin IPO or something it's like wait a minute you're happy to disrupt the book industry you're happy to disrupt the record industry why don't you disrupt the economy why don't you just you've got your first billion even now you're gonna do it again it's like get over it you know break the bank rather than then you know becoming the bank and in some ways, the way I'm hearing you talk about this is, is this is not just it's not just an intellectual or social or cultural or even spiritual issue. It's all of them. I mean, it's it's the way in some ways the way the framework we're sort of buying into and believing is is sort of true. Um, kind of keeps us running in this particular way. And then as these technologies develop, then we just sort of utilize them to continue doing that even more hyper efficiently. And yet, there's all these negative externalities. There's all these ways in which doing that affects the world in, in ways that we're going to have to deal with and eventually, you know, just thinking about all the people's uh, beach houses going underwater, maybe that'll be sort of what sh shocks right. them into noticing what's happening. Right. Here. I mean, part of that is because for most of us in our professions, we have to do a lot of management and there's a lot of entrepreneurial effort that goes on in what we're doing. And when you're entrepreneurial and sort of in that manager sense, it makes you feel like you're actually in control of something, right? Which, because in some sense you are, right? I'm going to plan, I'm going to strategize and all that. And when you're spiritual, you know, you can't strategize friggin' anything, right? It's just, it's, you're, you're, you know, the, your life happens to you in, in, in spite of your best laid plans. Hmm. And that's why you end up with this kind of duality. It's like easier on a certain level for yes. a peasant who's just picking rice to stay in flow the whole time, right? Because they never, they never uh, succumb to the illusion that they're in charge of something. But all of us, and especially in America, we're all in charge of our own destiny as freelancers. And, you know, as long as you think that, um, you're going to end up with that need to say, okay, this is the time when I'm going to let go of that of that illusion. But if you can somehow go meta on that and bring a sense of flow to the illusion of management, right, to the illusion of strategy, it's like, okay, I understand I'm playing this game where I've got to get something published, so I'm going to find someone who wants to publish it and I'm going to make them think it's really important and all that. You understand that you're playing a game, it becomes um, much less foreign to the, the ideals of, of a practice. And yet, you know, the, to take this analogy of playing a game, the, the way I heard you sort of talking about this sort of particular sh uh, set of assumptions that we have playing out, you know, in the form of, uh, you know, capitalist, particular capitalist system um, that's sort of derived, like you said, from 13th century, a lot of it from 13th century, you know, philosophy, you know, those assumptions serve as this kind of invisible context that guides our behavior you know and, and sort of tells in some ways to use your terminology sort of programs us in a, in a particular way um, so so it seems like there, there's a very big collective delusion going on in the way that I'm hearing you uh, describe this um, and I'm curious how do, how does one or how do we uh, break out of that kind of delusion, not just disrupting the book industry, but disrupting this whole way of thinking. Um, and this is a big question, but yeah, I mean, this is what I've been doing with all my books since the beginning. I mean, yeah. I wrote Siberia in like '92, was canceled in '93, but then published in '94 because they realized the internet was actually going to happen. Saying that this new sort of um, plastic vision of reality, this this notion of designer reality, is coming. And it's going to affect us on all different places, you know. And it's coming partly because of psychedelics and partly because of um, uh, 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 new digital technologies, um, you know, marrying together in a, a, a revival of you know Tao, Buddhist, and, and sort of ancient spiritual outlooks that that was going to come. And I ended up writing all these books that applied that insight, this sort of reality is open source insight to 
you know, uh, uh, you know, business and finance and Judaism and kids' culture and all these different things and democracy and government. Um, and then I realized we weren't even applying it to technology, that people were using the net and all these things without realizing the, the open source kind of origins of it, without, without seeing that. So to me, the, the core insight of the cyberdelic era was that reality is a series of programs that we can, or a whole lot of it is, that we can reprogram. And that, you know, you should be able to go out in the city streets and see, oh, New York is a grid pattern. Well, that's designed by somebody. That's not a given that's not a given circumstance of nature. That's a bunch of choices made by people. And if you can look at the things that humans are calling sacred and realize they're only calling them sacred and inviolable because those things are not, because those things can be questioned. It's like then you look at money and say, well, why do we use money this way? Who invented this kind of money? When did they do it? And what did they mean? You know, you look at everything as up for discussion. And that's um, that's sort of the most valuable thing that we can do. And yet, yeah, ends up political because only because there's a lot of things that they don't want to discuss. So if we want to discuss, well, look, what if the problem with the economy is not that people aren't willing to work hard and all that? What if it's that the kind of money we use actually is structured to extract value from people and, and store value in corporations. What if that actually there's not a good kind of money? What if we invented something else, whether it's Bitcoin or time dollars or a peer-to-peer -peer system? Or, you know, we're not allowed to talk about that, right? That threatens people. You know, that, so it's, it's, it's being willing to have those discussions. You know, and that's, mm -hmm. where, that's where the Judaism part comes in, because Judaism, mm -hmm. at least originally, was about that. It's can we talk? You know, can we have the, the discussion about anything? Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, and once you start to see the systems for what they are, these creations of people, in order to, you know, sometimes with the best of intentions, in order to control their environment or control other people or prevent certain things from happening, you can then um, start to see them not as, you know, distinct from nature, but as human expressions and as temporary and as up for, um, up for continuing. Um, evolution. Okay, this is interesting. D to use a kind of parallel from the from the contemplative traditions, you know, when when people start to question things, you know, certain core assumptions, you're like, like, who am I? Who am I really? You know, there's there is also you know w a well described uh, process of dissolution. You know, in the in the Christian tradition, they call it the dark night of the soul. You know, where where there's a period, a, a phase where once that bottle has been opened or that genie's been taken out of the bottle, you know, it, it's like reality shakes for a while and there's a sense of like, oh shit, you know, maybe who I thought I was is not who I really am and then there's nothing yet clear, you know, to grab onto or to, or to be able to kind of uh, say, oh, well, this is who I am. There's this period, you know, where there's a lot of fear and misery and disgust and, you know, freaking out and I... I, I can yeah, but see... why not get that over with? Get that over with as, to as young as possible. <laughs> to to totally. I mean, and, and, and not to say that it stops, you know, and it's not to say you go through it once. Um, but, I mean, I can see why perhaps that's part of this, this challenge, you know, that we face collectively is, you know, we don't want, I mean, when someone starts meditating, for instance, and that's this, they go start going through this phase, I mean, no one wants that. You know, no one wants to... D dissolve and for all their ideas, you know, to be in this sort of groundless position at a certain phase, but and yet well, they have to do. to go through it. Some do, but usually they're, they're, they end up being the, the best students at the beginning and then the worst at the middle. You know, someone who goes in because they're depressed, mm. right? So they want to dissolve the self. Yes. But they're that they're, they're great at the beginning because they throw themselves into it, but then they get really. They get in trouble later on. But yeah, we're doing that collectively as a society. I and mean, we've just moved through the most ego-oriented, individualistic phase of human civilization. Mm. Right? The individual was invented in the Renaissance. It was celebrated in the Enlightenment. Right? One man, one vote. And it was uh, almost perversely um, accentuated in the consumer age. Right? Mm. You, you deserve a break today. You, you're the one. Right? So that took the individual, you know, celebrated him, gave him rights, gave him a perspective, and then, you know, fed him as if he's this one thing apart from everything else. 
and the individual doesn't exist, right? <laughs> the self doesn't exist. Um, certainly not over time, but you know, it's ju you just it's it's just a window, you know. You just you're it's just a a perspective. And it's not to say you can't enjoy that perspective, but it's just this is just the, the this is your character sheet. This is the one that you're getting to play, <laughs> you know, and that's fine. I mean, it's fine. And why not get into the one you are, right? Well, Especially, and, you know, and your body's going to remind you that you're alone, you know, in that. You know, oh, soon uh, enough. And and that I mean, and that shift, you know, uh, that you're describing. I mean, that was in some ways was a quantum leap above, you know, sort of people just feeling like they just had to be, you know, uh, sort of subjugated as part of this, you know, aristocracy or whatever. I mean, that was a pretty big deal for people to step up and say, hey, like, I want, I want to have some say over how this, how this unfolds or how this plays out. Right, I'm an individual, but that's fine. So the baby is one with the mother, then the baby becomes an individual, and then the baby eventually becomes an adolescent and bonds with someone else. So, you know, you experience the self in order to yeah. lose the self because that's Beautiful that's play. the sublime uh, that's the sublime thing, but it never existed anyway, you know, in the in the final analysis. Right. It exists maybe as a phase or as a as a, a seeming part of a process. Well right. I, I guess that's that's that to me is important though that we recognize, you know, that, that that is an important phase though. You can't just skip that and and you know, say you were one with the mother in the beginning is different from being bonded to another person later after you've individuated. Right. You know, it's not right. the same state. It's a, it's a, it's a wholly new state. You know, that may look the same in some ways, but you couldn't, you know, you couldn't confuse them. That would be a dr dr drastic mistake. Right, because it's more like a conscious, uh, uh, you know, intentional right. love as opposed to a kind of a necessary, uh, you know. Survivalist love. Yeah, cool. Last thing I wanted to ask you about, um, again, another idea from Present Shock, is this notion of, yeah, the chimp. I just wanted to point out we've got some... Mine wants uh, to say hi. ...some monkey minds in here. <laughs> yeah, nice. We were looking for Buddhist iconography, and yeah. uh, this was the best we could do. <laughs> Han Hanuman. Hanuman was my closest. <laughs> so I wanted to ask about uh, chronobiology. You know, you mentioned it in the beginning. Um, this idea of t designing technologies around humans and around our cycles and our biologies, as opposed to the other way around. Um, could you say a bit more about that? Because I, I found that to be one of the most compelling and interesting ideas in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. You know, because we live in in a programmed age. You would think that we could begin programming our devices to, you know, conform to our underlying human rhythms, you know, the ones that we've become completely out of touch with. You know, and the human rhythms are always, whenever you bring them up, they get uh, kind of uh, uh, dismissed as folklore. Like when, um, when scientists were first talking about jet lag, um, the, the legitimate medical community dismissed it as bizarre, you know, as, as, as you know, some weird mythology um, or as astrology. And of course, it turns out it's not. You know, it took uh, major league baseball managers who realized that their pitchers did worse when they traveled west to east than when they traveled east to west. So they started changing their schedules. You know, and once the major league did it, then um, the U.S. diplomatic corps did it. That's because hilarious. They, yeah. <laughs> well, because you, if you're going to meet in Iceland, you can exploit. You can see when is your enemy's jet lag going to be at the worst, yet yours be at the best. So you can you can play with that too, and even with the drugs and everything else, there's only a certain amount that you can't overcome. Um, so they started to exploit that, and then it's like, okay, if the government's using it and sports is using it, then it's real. And they started to look at that, and um, you know, then later, really in the 70s and 80s, um, Olympic trainers started to look at um, different times of the day for training and optimizing this and optimizing that, and they found out that the uh, human beings have not only a day-night cycle but they have a lunar cycle. So that different weeks of the lunar cycle, people are better at doing different kinds of things. And then more recent studies are showing that we're dominated by different neurotransmitters during different weeks, 
different phases of the moon. So with a new moon, you tend to be dominated by acetylcholine, then you have a week of serotonin, then a week of dopamine, then a week of norepinephrine. So if you know everybody is in dopamine week, say, then that's not a week that we should be trying to get a lot of work done. Dopamine week is like party week and thrill-seeking, go skiing. You know, if you're in acetylcholine week, that's good for meeting people and you're all peppy. Or serotonin week, you're going to get a lot of work done. Norepinephrine is the fight or flight. Um, neurotransmitter, so you're going to be kind of above and apart from things. You're going to see things of a bit more structurally, a little cooler. So you know, organize your chapters, do your organizational charts for your company, think about long-term plans. If you start to sort of organize your life around these rhythms rather than trying to fight these rhythms in order to conform to the artificial schedule of some corporation, um, you end up really syncing up with where you are, you know, where you are as a person, where, you know, and, and once you do that, you kind of wake up, you know, your, your nervous system can wake up, you're, you're starting to optimize, and you know, I hate to talk about, you know, the body is a machine, but you're at least um, starting to go with the currents, you mm -hmm. know, you're, 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 there is, you know, nature does have its seasons, and days have their seasons, and moments have their seasons and people have their seasons and if you start to feel those seasons and how they're inside one another and you sort of circles within circles within circles um, you end up um, oriented to um, at least oriented to the apparent reality um, rather than um, trying to sink yourself to a mechanical reality and uh, it ends up um, I don't know, for me it's ended up a much more uh, appropriate um, path. You know, it's one that ends up making you much more perceptive um, to rhythms and much, just much more coherent, right? To, because you've spent, our, our bodies have spent a couple hundred thousand years um, adapting all of their processes to these, um, to these rhythms and to just ride roughshod over them uh, just uh, it makes it a lot harder to get a good night's sleep. Mm. <laughs> at, the, at the very minimum. <laughs> um, you, you know, just, just to wrap up, I really appreciate everything you said and um, certainly a lot of great things to reflect on here. Um, also just wanted to kind of point out something I noticed, which is in, in all of what you're saying, it seems like there is a way that you're describing a movement on the one hand, a movement back to something, uh, something that's kind of been lost, but then also a movement forward into something that has sort of not yet been realized. And yeah, well, it's, you know, Marshall beautiful. McLuhan is a great media theorist and, and media historian, and he talks about when you get a new medium, you know, you look at what it amplifies and what it, what it represses, you know, what it, what it flips into when it's taken to the extreme, but in some ways, most importantly, what does it retrieve? So if we are in a new media environment, a digital media environment, we end up retrieving some of the values that were repressed by the last uh, media environment. So, you know, the last renaissance when we got the printing press and, and, and uh, uh, mechanization and centralization of authority, um, all those kinds of things that um, destroyed the peer-to-peer -peer culture of the late Middle Ages, um, and witchcraft and the cult and all those things too, um, we're going to start to see those um, emerge again in this in this new society. So on one hand, it looks like a throwback. You know, uh, Burning Man has a ton of weird medieval stuff going on there, but it's also futuristic. You know, so what we do is we retrieve some of those um, older things that we've forgotten about and then rebirth them in a new form. Literally, renaissance, a rebirth, right? It's a rebirth of old ideas in a new context. So, you know, we get to bring back some of the greatest hits from the past and, um, and reconstitute them in a way that's appropriate to, to our future. That's awesome. I feel like in, in some ways that's, that's sort of the core mission of what we're doing with Buddhist Geeks is how do you do that with a, a wisdom tradition like Buddhism? 
So uh, yeah, thank you. These are great thoughts. It is and Buddhist it, geek, right? Buddhist geek is is you know an apparent oxymoron. But what Buddhist geek really is, I mean, and and the NLP people, neuro linguistic programmers, talk about this a lot. When you bring together two words that seem opposite, it creates a new slot in the brain, right? For the new for the new possibility. It's like permaculture. It's like what permaculture? Wait a minute, what? What? It's like yeah. Um, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, thank, thanks for thanks for spending the time to uh, chat with us. Really cool. Oh, well, thank you for doing it. All right, and you stay in touch. All right, we'll do. Thanks, Douglas. All right, Take care. Be good. All right. Bye. Bye.